Hi, my name is Nick Hopwood. I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney. Welcome to this series of four videos about publishing in academic journals. You might have been asked to watch this video as part of preparation for a workshop that you're going to do with me in the next few days or weeks. In which case, please make note of some questions that you have that you don't think were answered in the video or anything you think I've missed, as well as some of the key learning points you've taken from this video. If you found this video through YouTube or through my blog, please feel free to add comments or questions in the relevant place below on the video. This first video will be about what's changing and what's not changing in the publishing industry and what the implications of this are for us as academic publishers and researchers. So let's to get into this series of videos on understanding academic journal publishing and peer review. The videos overall will cover the things that you see on the screen here and I'll introduce them one by one. I strongly recommend you watch them all and in this particular sequence sense. So this first video is really about the publishing industry. Are things changing radically? Are some things not changing? And what do publishers do anyway for us as academics? Lots of things are changing in academic journal publishing. Certainly the scale of things is unprecedented. There are more and more journals and interestingly they're owned generally by fewer publishers. Uh, who is the biggest publisher will uh, vary on your discipline but the trend is definitely for more journals to be acquired by fewer journal companies, publishing companies, and the publishing companies are actually acqu acquiring each other so they're becoming bigger and bigger and fewer of them but more and more journals for us to publishing. As nearly all journal content is now digitally available from many countries, this changes all sorts of things. We have digital content, there are now video visual abstracts, different ways of counting, who downloads journal articles and who cites them. This has profound implications for how people access and find our papers and why they might bother to read them. I'll come later on to talk about information linkage, but associated with these changes in technology, it's going to become increasingly easy to specify exactly who's written what and paid for by whom. There are now some new risks that weren't there before. There are predatory journal publishers trying to get your work published in their journals, and some of them are fraudulent, and I'll talk to you about how you can avoid those. So there is a risk that you give your work away to illegitimate or unrecognised publishers by accident, and you don't want to make you don't want to do that. There are also big changes to do with how you access journal articles. Uh, it used to be rather a stark choice, and I'll show you in a couple of slides how this is changing to be something a bit more nuanced. But there are some things that are not changing in journal publishing. The core values about journals being there to disseminate knowledge, peer review system being there as a mechanism of quality control, and that many journals actually are owned by companies who have ultimately commercial interests and profit motives. There are some special things about academic journal publishing which means it's not going to change in some of the ways that other publishing might be. The essential content, the unit of the journal article, is not profoundly different now from what it has been for many, many years. Although there are new artefacts being added to these, the central piece remains stable. Journals for many disciplines remain a key, or journal articles, remain a key form of academic capital. How you build up your academic reputation and maybe get promotion or get a job. Uh, in some disciplines, books are very important, may even be more important than journal articles, but still journal articles are a key form of academic capital. The bottom line for getting a journal article accepted is novelty, that you have something new to say. You're saying something that nobody else has said before. That's how people make money out of journal publishing, and that's how journals get uh, status accrued because people are writing original content that they can't read anywhere else. And finally, rejection has always been a part of academic publishing, and I assume it will always remain so. There are certainly no signs that rejection is disappearing. Now, lots of people seem to think that publishers are the bad guys in this, uh, and that academics do all the writing, peer reviewers, uh, more academics do the reviewing for free, many editors do that for free, and journal publishers get to take all the money. That doesn't seem very fair. Well, it may seem unfair, but in fact, journal publishers do a huge amount of things that universities or individual academics are not well positioned to do. They're hugely important in leading these changes that I've been describing. They've supported a lot of startups, and they now pay a dollar for every pu published paper so that it can have a digital object index number. They help a huge amount of things in terms of promoting your work and making people able to find it 
Also, they help with making it more appealing to readers with things like video abstracts, which I'll mention later in the video. Journal publishers also help protect your intellectual property and make sure that the associations between you and your work stay together. It makes it harder for other people to steal your work. Journal publishers also invest a huge amount of money in infrastructure. They create digital platforms that we use to submit articles, to review articles and to edit journals. They have systems for peer review. They have systems for download and tracking download and making things available free or through a paywall. Huge amount of online digital infrastructure as well as traditional print infrastructure. Journal publishers actually do a lot to help editors, reviewers and authors do their jobs better. They, they create and publish a lot of helpful videos and written guides, which I suggest that means that journal publishers are actually engaged pedagogically with supporting the academic community. A really good example of this is the video made by James Hardcastle from Taylor and Francis, one of their most watched videos about uh, old metrics and journal publishing. So, is it the case that the contract between the researcher and the publisher is that the researcher writes the paper and the publisher does all this amazing marketing and makes everybody want to read it? Uh, not quite. You still have a lot of work to do, unfortunately, these days. It used to be that the uh, print-based journals meant, apart from giving out paper copies to people, there wasn't much you could do as an academic to promote readership of your articles. But now there is a lot you can do, and if you don't do it, other people writing similar articles on your topic will be, and you'll fall behind. So there are lots of things you can be doing using Twitter, social media, investing other people in tweeting links to your project or your publications. You might have a blog or use QDOS. You might take up the opportunity to have a video or a visual abstract. You can put lists of publications in your email signature, and you might engage with something like ResearchGate, though you need to be careful doing that. If you see on the right there, there's a, a box that describes how altmetrics work. I'll come back to altmetrics in the third video about journal status indicators. Uh, but it shows, it points to the kind of work that an author might need to do in promoting their own work. If you haven't heard of Sherpa before, use this video as an impetus after watching it to go and find out more about it. This helps widen access to the free versions of journal articles. Uh, without undermining the publisher's fundamental commercial model. Librarians often are really up to date with the copyright conditions and Sherpa is a system which makes it much easier to know what you can do with the word version of your journal article that was accepted by the publishers. Different colours indicate different things that you're allowed to do without infringing the copyright agreement that you have with a particular commercial publisher. I mentioned predatory journals and that the development of these creates new kinds of risk to authors. The risk of losing your work uh, and not being able to publish it in a credible journal and thinking or being duped into thinking that you're actually publishing for a decent journal when you're not. Uh, there are two very easy ways to uh, check on these. Now nothing is 100% foolproof but you can go to Beale's list and Beale has a very very explicit and transparent process or making judgments about journals and you can go to think check submit now if you're really thinking of a journal and you're not sure whether it's legit or not talk to your supervisors or other people about it generally a journal owned by one of the big major um, publishing companies like Wiley Informer which would be Taylor and Francis or Routledge Springer Elsevier Emerald um, and they've been around for a while with lots of volumes, you're up to volume 25 or 30 or something like that, is going to be safe. You might want to be really careful if the editors of the journal seem very keen to have your papers and very desperate to get submissions, if the peer review takes place extraordinarily quickly with very little critical comment. Um, you might be sprung for a, a nasty fee to publish. Uh, and you might also be very careful if the journal is very new, particularly if you're expected to be in volume one, issue one. I mentioned stable links before. Now it's an amazing thing that's happening. If you don't already have one, you should get an ORCID ID as soon as you finish watching these four videos. It's free and everybody who's thinking of publishing should have one. ORCID actually finds a lot of the articles that you write by default because the articles have digital object indexes. That's what the journal publishers pay a dollar for everyone so this DOI number gets created for you. You don't have to do that work. The publishers do it for you or pay somebody to do it for you. So what ORCID does is can look between the DOI 
for your work. But you can also add it manually. So there's a stable object identifier for each paper and there's a stable num numerical identifier for each author, which is really important when people start having more than, pe more than one person has the same name or for people who might change their names during their life for some reason. Now, what's going to come around the corner very soon is stable object identifiers for funders as well. So you'll be able to see for any one person what they've published and who funded it, for any one uh, paper, who wrote it and who funded it, and for any one funder, what all the different authors and publications resulting from that funding have been. ORCID ID is a really important thing. Get your iPad ORCID ID if you haven't already got one. This is what can happen when algorithms get confused or people get confused between people. There are two Nick Hopwoods working in academia, one of them in Cambridge on a completely different topic for me and myself in Australia, formerly in Oxford. The stuff in green is true about me, the stuff that's not in green is not. And so here we have contemporary authors completely confusing me and another Nick Hopwood. The idea of ORCID ID and digital object indexes is to avoid this. Now this might seem quite frivolous because it's just somebody trying to write a summary of me or the other Nick Hopwood as an academic. I'm not sure which one they thought they were writing about. But it starts to matter when you think about Scopus and Google and um, other uh, algorithms counting your research papers, counting citations to those papers. And the numbers that they come up with are very significant for job applications and promotion panels. And if they're not counting half your work because they think it belongs to another person of the same name, that's a real big problem. Thanks for watching this first video. The second one will be about copyright, open access, and all sorts of issues to do with who pays for journal articles. Hi, I'm Nick Hopper from the University of Technology, Sydney. Welcome to this, the second of four videos on academic journal publishing. If you haven't watched the previous one, I suggest you do watch that one first. This one is all about issues to do with copyright, open access, and who pays at what point in the process to read a journal article. So, now we move on to the second in the four series of videos. This one is about copyright, open access, and who pays for what. Now, it's easy to think about these things in terms of open versus closed access. The closed one is the historically dominant one. Somebody, the reader, has to pay. That used to be uh, perhaps a library subscribing to a journal, hard copies coming into the shelves. It could have been perhaps as a member of a professional association where part of your membership means you receive a hard copy of the journal. These days it's not only hard copies you have to pay for but digital copies too. You might find a journal article you want to read, you can read the abstract but if you want to download the full PDF it asks you to pay or you might have to log in via your institutional library and they, if they've got a license with a publisher then a whole bunch of journals the content will be freely available but the library's paid for that or the university has. So this is seen as locking up knowledge for a privileged few and it's seen as controversial because often publicly funded research is as ultimately paid for by taxpayers. So why should somebody who's paid for the research pay again to read the outcomes? In contrast to this, we have open access. And the idea of that is that anybody with an internet connection can access that material anytime. There is no paying twice, paying for the research in the first place and then paying again uh, to read it. And there is an idea that open access supports global equality of access. So institutions which aren't able to afford big site licenses for all the content for, say, Springer or Elsevier. Open access makes that available, all our content available to people, regardless of their ability to pay or their institution's ability to pay. I don't think it's quite this simple anymore. Um, certainly there are still articles that remain behind uh, paywalls. And there are articles that are freely available to everybody permanently. But there are lots of different shades in between this now. For example, in a recent publication I did with Elsevier, it gave me a link automatically when a publication was first came online and said for 50 days, anybody can download this for free. Unlimited number of downloads for 50 days. So that's open access in a temporarily limited way. The Taylor and Francis journal I published with offered a link with uh, a, li a limited number of downloads. So that didn't expire over time, but different number of people could, a uh, certain set number of people could download it. Taylor and Francis also have a star program and other publishers have similar things where they offer a limited number of days of free access to particular students from low income countries. And as well, even with a paper where the PDF, all formatted nicely by the publisher, is behind a paywall, the Sherpa system, which I mentioned before in video one, might mean that a version of it, say a Word version of the accepted 
uh, manuscript might be available freely to everybody through an institutional repository. So it's not just a one or a zero of free to everybody or everybody has to pay. There are now lots of variations on what access looks like. So what does this mean for you? Well, firstly, that you have to do your homework and not be stung by a publishing fee or surprised by the cost of open access. You might submit to a journal where it's free to submit uh, and to publish, um, but if you want the paper to be open access, you might be charged $3,000. Equally, you might be submitting for an open access journal, but surprised to find that you have to pay a $350 administration or publishing fee. It also means that you have to manage your copyright very carefully. Use the Sherpa system, getting help from your library so that you don't break the copyright agreements with the publishers. And particularly being careful about how you use something like ResearchGate. Whilst you might see lots of other people uploading PDFs of copyrighted articles onto ResearchGate, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, firstly, you're breaking the copyright with the uh, publishers, most likely, but you might also be infringing uh, your employers or your uh, university, if you're a student's uh, code of practice as a researcher. Now remember, at the end of the day, usually, or nearly always, somebody pays for a journal article at some point, whether it's the university paying the researchers to do the research in the first place, and often in commercial publishing, of course, somebody is making money. So we, don't, we have to be careful that we don't undermine this model. Um, I've put a little note at the bottom there that uh, it's... Because of the complexities around this, it's important not to be naive and think that paywalls are inherently unfair and open access is going to solve all our problems. Thank you for watching this second video. The third video will be about issues to do with the status of journals, how we measure how good they are, impact factors, altmetrics and all sorts. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Nick Copford from the University of Technology, Sydney. Welcome to this third video in my series of four about publishing in academic journals. This is all about how good journals are, how we know how good they are, and how we try to measure that. So things like impact factors, other status indicators, and altmetrics will be covered. So here we are now in the third video about status indicators, impact factors, altmetrics, and things in between. So how do you know how good a journal is? Well, this is certainly not all the ways of telling, but it's a useful summary that gives you a sense of the different sorts of approaches. There is impact factor. This is probably the most well-known and the most established notion of how to measure the quality of a journal. It used to be owned by Thomson Reuters. It's now been sold to Clarivate Analytics. Impact factor is a measure of how many times a journal article from a particular journal is cited in other journals on a particular list where the people doing the counting look. The advantage of impact factor is it tends not to get it wrong if, in terms of if there's a very high impact factor there's a really good chance that yes lots of journal articles from that journal are widely cited. It's seen as the gold science standard in most of the science disciplines and lots of the journals, journals at least those run by commercial publishers give the impact factor on their home pages. So they link, the journals are actually linked to impact factor. It also has the strictest standards for inclusion, which some people think means you've got a better quality measure. But those strict standard means it doesn't look in a very a large number of journals compared to other measures. And it completely ignores books and book chapters in terms of where it looks for citations to work. So you get lots of false negatives. Journals with a low impact factor, they might actually have lots of citations but they're just not in your journals at all, or not in journals within the relatively narrow list that Impact Factor looks at. There is a time window that often is irrelevant in many humanities, arts and social sciences fields. If it takes 18 months to get a journal paper published and then somebody has to read it and then write another paper, the chances of being cited within two or three years are very slim. And in fact, some of the best work in those fields may be still cited 10 or 15 years later that's not going to affect an impact factor of a journal. Whereas in sciences where new knowledge tends to replace old knowledge, it makes more sense, and the publishing is quicker, it makes more sense to have a short time frame for measuring quality. It also takes a long time for a new journal to be included within the list of journals that impact factor looks on. So lots of people rely and say it's the best, but it has some clear limitations, particularly in Haas fields. There is the SJR, or Scimago Journal, ranking. This has a bigger list of journals it looks in and it's very easy to look up. You just type the journal title and then SJR into Google and it'll come up. You also see very easily the trends 
how the, uh, their equivalent of impact factor, the SJR measure, has changed over time. It's not so respected in the sciences, and it's not often quoted on journal pages, so it feels like it's a little bit disassociated from the formal journals. There's a new one called SightScore, just released in December 2016. This is again more inclusive than Impact Factor. It is also powered by Scopus. Um, you get the SJR information when you also look at the SightScore, so you might as well, I think, go to SightScore directly. Um, book series can get a, a score as well as journals, and journals are included more quickly when they're launched on the site score list, as long as they meet some basic quality criteria. The disadvantages here are it's new and it's not quite clear who will use it or value it as a benchmark. Um, and it actually looks at all contents in the journal rather than just the peer reviewed content. So it might mean uh, sort of some false positives in that uh, you get a higher score just because you don't have much editorial content or something like that. There was another way of doing this in Australia, which was I call the zombie ranks. Uh, uh, lots of academics got together within disciplines and ranked the journals A star, A, B, and so on. Um, and it was seen to be more meaningful than trying to put a number. You know, is an impact factor of 0 0.141 really better than an impact factor of 1.5? You know, who, who knows, is that a really a meaningful difference? So a collection of uh, kind of grades, if you like, seemed to be more sensible and it wasn't based on measurement, it was based on idea of peer review. Uh, but it was abandoned by the Australian government and no new journal will be uh, uh, ranked in this system anymore. And peer review does not necessarily mean that you guarantee good decisions. Now, how are these things calculated? Well, the impact factor looks at the citations to all referee papers in journal X over a particular time frame, and you can see there's two-year or five-year impact factors. And then it takes the number of referee papers published in that journal over that time frame. So it's how many citations divided by the number of papers. In site score, it's looking at all the citations in the documents from three years and dividing it by the number of um, papers published in a particular journal over that same time frame. So it's a similar um, kind of equation for both of them. Now altmetrics look very differently. Altmetrics give a score to a journal, rather like Impact Factor gives a score to a journal, but this looks up in how many news outlets mention things, blogs, is it referenced in policy documents, they look for Twitter. No, it's not tweets mentioning the author or the title, it's tweets with links to the digital object index, so the URL that has that DOI information. I mentioned DOI in the first video. It might look on Facebook pages as well. Uh, Mendeley, which is a referencing system. So altmetrics look in a whole different set of different places to come up with a different score. And it doesn't mean that if you tweet the same link 15 times, you're going to increase your score by 15. It's smart enough to know, and it wants really different people to be tweeting uh, links to a particular article to get a high score. So altmetrics are a measure of activity around academic content, not just citations or download figures. Um, so Wikipedia, course materials, mentions in policy, range of things. Now you have to think about, well, how is your paper going to get into these things if you just leave it there on the web? You've got work to do with making people aware of it, and not only aware of it, but making people realize that your paper is worth reading and then quoting. So how do you know whether a journal is any good or not? Which indicators should you pay most attention to? Well, the part of the answer to that depends on your field. If you're in the sciences, impact factor is going to be really important. If you're in the humanities, arts and social sciences, you probably want to be aware of the impact factor, but you're going to be much more reliant on some of these alternative measures, particularly, my guess will be, site score is going to become one of the, the kind of go-to uh, indicators to use. The absolute number is almost meaningless. The relative number compared to other journals in the field is really important. In some fields, an impact factor of less than 10 is regarded as low, in my field, anything over one is regarded as quite high. Soft indicators, don't forget these. I mean things like, are people that you really respect publishing this in a journal? Are people that you respect um, citing articles from this journal? That's not a counting thing, that's thinking, who's really good in my field? What are they reading? And what are, where are they publishing themselves? And you can tell where they're reading because they're, you can look at their reference lists and see which journals they've been looking in. And perhaps the choice of the journal isn't about status in the first place. It's partly about status, but it's most about whether you have 
a paper that looks and feels like papers that are already in this journal, i.e. it's a question of fit or match between the aims and scope of the journal and what you have to say. So, choosing a journal to target. Like I said, the most important thing might be, are there papers that look and feel like mine? Then you might look at the aims and scope, but the aims and scope aren't always brilliantly written. So precedent, finding precedent for papers that are it's starting the conversation that you're going to extend and join is absolutely preferable. Of course, you want to look at status values, but you don't want to take them at face value. And remember that soft indicators might be more meaningful. If you've got 5,000 words you need to write, there's no point submitting to a journal that's got a 2,000 word limit, and you should know that before you even start writing. You need to do your homework about the publisher. Does this publisher support video abstracts? What does it cost for open access if I want this? What kind of open access will they allow? What will their Sherpa um, arrangements be uh, with? What can I do with the Word version that's accepted if I get accepted? You might all want to investigate time to publication. Some journals review much quicker than others, you can sometimes tell that by the information that comes under the abstract. It'll give you a guide as to how long the review and publishing process is taken. If not, you can usually email the editor. Thanks for sticking with me for three videos. Only one left to go. The fourth video will be about peer review and start off for some of the key issues that we'll be discussing in the workshop. Hi, I'm Nick Hopwood, and this is the fourth in my series of four videos about academic journal publishing. This one is all about peer review. So we're getting to the end of this video sequence now and I'm just going to start the conversation around peer review and if you're coming to the workshop we'll go into this in much more depth. So peer review is really established as a way to maintain quality, to make sure that you can't just write anything you like. The idea is that somebody who works in your field has a look, checks it, makes some comments for improvement. Reviewers are rarely paid. Most editors aren't paid either. Some in some fields, like in medicine, will be very highly paid, but generally editors are not paid to do their editing. The idea of double blind is that nobody, the reviewer, doesn't know who is written the first the, the article in the first place, and the author doesn't know who is being reviewing them. I put supposedly there because often if it's a author who's written quite a lot in a particular area, it's very obvious to the reviewers who the author is. And you can also quite often figure out who the reviewers are and if you're coming to the workshop with me there'll be one example where that's pretty clear. There's some ethics here about peer review. If you send off a journal article and your uh, work is reviewed by three people, you owe at least three reviews. Uh, my idea would be to do some more to reviews before you send something off so that you're not in review debt as soon as you get reviewed but rather you've got some in the bank. Uh, to kind of spend on getting your work reviewed. It's really important because if you don't do as many reviews as you receive reviews, what's happening is the reviewing work is falling on fewer and fewer people's shoulders and that's not good for our intellectual um, kind of health. What we need is a diversity of reviewers working in the field and if you don't step up and do the reviews that you owe, it'll fall on the few people who do keep saying yes and that's not good for scholarship. It's important to remember that editors make decisions, not reviewers. Reviewers can recommend decisions, and editors often don't contradict them completely, but it's the editor who makes a decision, not the reviewer. And it's important to remember that reviewers don't all get it right, and if you're coming to the workshop with me, that'll be one of the key things that we explore. Now, lots of people like to say these days that peer review is broken or falling apart. Uh, you can see increasingly there are um, very public errors um, errors in papers that get through the peer review process and people blame the review process as much as they blame the authors for doing flawed research in the uh, first place. Uh, so there are an increasing number of retractions, particularly in scientific journals. Um, it's getting hard to find reviewers, hard to find reviewers who say yes, and harder still to find reviewers who say yes and produce good reviews on time. As I mentioned, the idea of reviews being double blind is a myth and we all know this often with experienced uh, or well-published research authors, people will be able to figure out who's written it. When people get to write anonymously and just send off their criticisms to the editor, academics often misbehave and there is plenty of example of unprofessional uh, conduct in the process of peer review that I'll show you proof of in the uh, workshop if you're joining me in that. And it is increasingly that the predatory publishers or other outlets bypass peer review or have such a shoddy version of it that it's essentially uh, dead in their hands. 
But I think peer review is proving resilient and perhaps reinventing itself. I don't think it's going to go away in the next few years. Definitely not. It's not perfect, but I strongly believe it is the best system we've got. Uh, we can improve this by having better pedagogies of peer review, teaching people not only how to review, but how to respond to reviews. Uh, there are resources from publishers, I mentioned this in video one, about what the publishers do. And you can attend amazing workshops like the one hopefully you'll come and sit in with me soon about how to do reviews and how to receive reviews. Um, increasingly, journals in the sciences are starting, it's not a huge trend yet, but some are publishing the reviews and the author's responses online, so it's making the whole process more transparent. Um, new infrastructure is helping like that, often authors are automatically added to review databases, now they have centralised electronic systems for managing journals. Uh, so that is assisting with peer review and some of those problems about finding reviewers. And the paths that bypass peer review are not valued as highly, if at all. So if a non-peer review journal article, for example, isn't really recognised for most academic institutions or promotion or job application purposes. Now there are some non-peer reviewed outputs that are important and they're often relating to engagement and impact, but they're not rated or valued in the sense of a scholarly publication. Oh, so is this everything for now? Well, clearly not. I'm sure you will have questions. There are things that these four videos haven't covered. Please put your questions in the comments or visit one of my blog posts that's relevant to the issues of journal publishing and put some comments or questions there. Come to a workshop with me if it's coming up in your uh, institution or get in touch and see if you can arrange for me to come and give a workshop. You can uh, tweet me at nhoputs. And do remember that things are changing really fast and what's true by the time I made this video may well have changed by the time you watch it. Thanks for watching all four of my publications videos. I hope you found them useful and informative. Like I said at the beginning, if you do have questions, please make notes on them and bring them to the workshop if you're coming to a workshop with me soon. If not, you can put questions or comments underneath the video on YouTube or you can visit my blog nickhop.wordpress.com and find a relevant post and add your comments there. You can also tweet me at nhoputs. I'm looking forward to hearing from you soon. Bye-bye.